What's going on everyone? So today I have a massive video for you all. We are going to be ranking every single rare and legendary from set two. And now that, well, not only have I played a ton of games online, but also played quite a few games in paper, I have been able to play with every single rare and legendary you see here. And there are some truly great ones and some truly weak ones. So we're gonna talk about each one individually, the tiers, and of course, rank them as we go through the video. This one's gonna be a long one as we, I think have close to 80 cards here as I was downloading all the images. This one took a little while. So uh, before we dive in, guys, I just want to mention, I have a TCG player link in the description down below. If you guys use it, it does help me out as well as help you out. If you want to pick up any of the set two rares and legendaries, we'll see here. Let's talk about the tiers first before we dive into our first cards. So because we have so many cards to go through, it is very important to actually describe each tier and go through the guiding principles of where a lot of these cards are going to go. So starting us off with the S tier, these are cards that are going to be meta defining. They could potentially cause you to actually go through and build a specific deck because of these, well, maybe a specific card or potentially a couple because they fit into that color combination, or it just ends up being generally powerful and it kind of just helps you smooth out your entire strategy and helps you get to the thing that you want to get to. Uh, a really important card for this S tier might just be something as simple as a super laser technician. I would definitely put that in S tier for set one. A tier cards are going to be cards that might be a little bit more inconsistent that you'll see in S tier and uh, do things that are immensely powerful, but as I said, maybe not as often, or just generally decently powerful cards that help you go through and make your deck function. An A tier card that I'd be happy to mention um, that is quite solid is like a steadfast battalion, right? It is good. It works with the leaders, but you know, in some cases it kind of doesn't do too much if you don't have your leader out. A B tier card is going to be a card that uh, is maybe incredibly inconsistent but in some cases can help you win the game or cards that you know just kind of are unassuming but really do make the deck work uh the cards that i would immediately think of when i think of b tier are cards like a wing and battlefield marine perhaps you could even push them a little bit closer to a tier but that's the type of card that i want to see is a card that's not immensely impressive but just does things that are really solid the c tier category is for cards that are really just unimpressive or potentially are too high costed don't really fit the correct part of the curve or don't really allow you to kind of do what you're looking to do in a deck even though it kind of seems like it might be a card that is worth playing set one options that i, I think of when i think of c tier like general tog um snow trooper lieutenant those types of cards where you know in fleet lieutenant's case it's amazing because you get a card down and then you can go in and play it get the extra bonus but so trooper comes down on two which makes it so much worse than any other thing like fleet lieutenant and d tier cards these are cards that uh, generally speaking rares and legendaries don't fit into but because we're ranking only layers and legendaries we will have some d tier but these are the real stinkers either they have like no place in the meta or maybe they're just incredibly an expensive card to the point where it's impossible to actually play or their effect is just incredibly weak there could be all manner of things but d tier cards are cards that i basically would advise you never to play at least c tier you might get some arguments where it's like but what if i do this d tier are gonna be like wow that just is a mega stinker so that's gonna be the tiers and let's start us off with the vigilance cards here first up the first card i have up on the list is actually first light now this is actually a pretty interesting one i'll put it on the list here probably starting off awesome with b tier just because um i want to talk about the card and then i'll place it but uh seven resource four seven space unit it really does kind of hammer home your grit strategies. And really the, the place that I've seen First Light and, and tried First Light has defaulted to Kira. I've even tried it in a Grand Inquisitor list and uh, I even tried actually splashing it in a Han list where a lot of their decks theme uh, is basically doing damage to their own units. And it actually is a powerful finisher. And uh, while well, I did just drop it in B tier so we can see it, I actually do think it fits into B tier. This is a card where it is pretty inconsistent. Uh, there are times when you play this and it just pumps up your board like no other. There are some times when you can smuggle this out and it's like an oppressive, oppressive thing to do because the four damage pumps up something to where you can't actually deal with it. There might be some shield tokens on, on Kira's side of the battlefield or whatever, and it's just super hard to deal with. But most of the time it's going to be uh, just a seven resource four seven that might give like plus two, plus three or so power to the rest of your board. And so, well, it's a decent finisher, but it does end up being pretty inconsistent. 
Next up, we have Imprisoned. This is, well, initially what people thought of as like a semi-removal spell or removal upgrade, but it actually is pretty weak in general. And uh, I could even argue for uh, probably C tier. I might end up like moving some things down depending on how this list shapes up, but uh, you get to attach this to a non-leader unit and boom, you lose their, or they get a bit, they lose their abilities and they can't get abilities. Okay, whatever. There are some situations where units don't even care about their abilities. Like you play a battle film and you're like, yeah, that's a great card on turn one. Imprison does nothing against it. And uh, there are not a lot of decks that actually want this. There are some cases where it could be decent, right? Like if you're facing a K2SO or, um, you know, Poe Dameron or something like that, where it has a very powerful ability, then yeah, you can remove it and, and prevent yourself from getting hit by those abilities. But guess what? You know, you put it on a K2SO, it's still 4-4. Four -four. It's still a 6-6 six -six for Poe Dameron. And, and, and those things just keep going at you. So Imprisoned, pretty weak. And uh, if it could hit to a or uh, attached to a leader unit then we could be talking about something maybe a b tier but uh, i think starting off a c tier and maybe even in a d tier uh, is a pretty fitting place for that long pike uh, so this one is a four resource four six but has an interesting on attack ability where you have to give a shield token to an enemy unit and if you do you give a shield token to a friendly unit this really is good in decks that actually care about upgrades specifically and maybe have a high value unit to protect However, uh, while I do think it is decent, I don't think it's actually better than First Light, and uh, we're going to keep it in the B tier. This is a card that, uh, in some cases, could be extremely oppressive, right? Like, they have something that you don't care about. You give it a shield token, and then you get a shield token on your big unit that you get to protect, especially in grit strategies or upgrade strategies. Um, Gar Saxon can use Long Pike decently well. It does have Smuggle as well, so sometimes you can smuggle it out and get some value a little bit later, but overall, not that impressive. Next up, we have a oh, uh, heroism card to talk about. We got Mandalorian. It's a six costed heroism vigilance, five, six sentinel, and you get to heal up, give shield tokens to a unit that costs two or less. Obviously, this is calling out the Grogu. Unfortunately for us, this is a six resource, five, six sentinel for the vast majority of cases. And uh, while that can be solid, right? We've seen things like Obi-Wan be okay, um, and in some cases, decent. Unfortunately for us, um, Mandalorian doesn't have the on death trigger that Obi-Wan does. So I think it's a little bit worse. And in fact, I would actually drop him down into C tier. I've tried to get this guy to work. I've even played in a Mandalorian yellow deck where I played the Mandalorian and Grogu. But uh, as you all will see, or if I have not posted already, I cut both of them from the list because it just doesn't actually do all that much. And the central is just a, a little bit weaker than what other options you have. In fact, I'd rather just play Obi-Wan instead of the Mandalorian. Next up, we have Mandalorian Armor, uh, which is a pretty powerful upgrade. It's a plus one, plus three upgrade. It has to be on non-vehicle units. And if the unit you attach it to is Mandalorian, you give a shield token to it. So um, when I look at Mandalorian Armor, I think about the leaders that are Mandalorians, right? Like the Mandalorian, Gar Saxon, those types of characters, Bo-Katan. Any character that is a Mandalorian is, uh, or leader, I should say, that is a Mandalorian is exceptionally more exciting with this. Of course, because you are guaranteed to have that leader. It's the same thing with like Vader's lightsaber, Luke's lightsaber, Fallen lightsaber, Jedi lightsaber. Anytime you have a unit that can specifically benefit from, or a leader that can specifically benefit from one of the cards you're playing, that's where it gets a little bit more exciting. The problem is, is that Mandalorian armor, while it is good, there's not a lot of Mandalorians on the curve besides um, some pretty weak ones. Like there, there are some good ones, don't get me wrong. Like um, you could play like Follow the Way, that could be good. Sabine Wren, that could be good, that type of stuff. But in general, this, um, this upgrade really wants to be attached to a Mandalorian to see some value because there are a lot of better upgrades that I think on two resources, heck, even like Academy training plus two plus so uh, plus two plus two is even a little bit more exciting than Mandalorian armor. However, because of the powerhouse um, that it does bring to Mandalorians, I'm actually gonna put it a little bit ahead of First Light and Long Pike because it does work well in specific scenarios. Um, uh, even better. Dr. Pershing, two resource, zero five. You get to deal one damage to a friendly unit and draw a card. Uh, unfortunately, guys, you do not want to be actioning to deal one damage to a friendly unit to draw a card. I have played with Dr. Pershing. One of the decks that I've been the most impressed with Dr. Pershing in is like a Kira mid-range almost control deck where you care about or, or you don't mind the damage dealt to friendly units because you have grit synergies. I played Dr. Pershing also in a Krennic list, which was pretty nice, where you deal damage to, to Pershing and he's actually a 1-4, um, which is a lot more exciting. You can even deal damage to your other units to kind of pump them up and draw some more cards. Unfortunately, 
that's not good enough. And uh, I'm actually gonna put him in the C tier. I think he's a little bit better than Mandalorian and Imprisoned, and he does do some things in some cases. You can play him in a control deck if you'd like, but unfortunately that ends up being a little bit slow or on the slower side. And so you don't wanna do too much of that. And I found, to be, uh, or I found it to be pretty slow and pretty mediocre. Second chance. So this is the double vigilance legendary card that uh, we revealed a little while ago, or I didn't reveal, but I went over and talked about uh, as it went out, uh, came out. This one has a really interesting one where essentially when that unit is defeated, uh, you can go ahead and play it from your discard pile for free. Here's the problem with this card. There's a couple, but the biggest problem is that, well, if you attach this to a unit, your opponent doesn't really want to defeat it. So then you're forced to kind of sit there, trade with your, or attempt to trade with your opponent's units. So you can kind of refresh this. Second thing is, your opponent can kind of also ignore it. Like, you don't care about it. Like, yeah, if your opponent tries to trade with your units, like, sure, you spent four resources to, um, you know, play it on a four drop or, or three drop or less. Or if you play it later on in the game, that might just be a little bit too slow. And again, your opponent can kind of mess around with it with things like defeating upgrades or bouncing it to your hand, like you know, waylays or things like that. It is actually an atrocious card. And uh, the third thing, I guess, if I wanted to add something more to it, it's double vigilance and there's not a lot of double vigilance cards that you're looking to like refresh in the middle parts of the game um so for me it's actually a d tier card uh it's kind of surprising but yeah uh this is a legendary where i'm very unimpressed with i've tried to get this thing to work i've tried some crazy stuff like okay let's ramp uh into like avenger and then play second chance for six resources nope let's try to go ahead and like Play this for four resources on like i don't know a child sin also not that great um there are just so many ways around this there are situations where um you know you can get value from it for sure but it's just so inconsistent it doesn't actually do all that much usually and in the rare rare case where you get to you know replay something that was powerful you could have also just replaced second chance with another powerful card in your deck and it would have been way more consistent Supreme Leader Snoke is up next, and uh, this is a pretty interesting one. Eight resource, six, six, that gives all non-leader units that your enemy controls minus two, minus two. This card's actually been better than I thought it was going to be, but I thought it was going to be pretty mediocre to bad. Um, I've played it in some controlling lists. I've played it in some mid-range lists, uh, you know, in like a Kira list. I, I've played this one. Of course, when we see uh, Vigilant or Vigilance Villainy, then you kind of think Kira, you kind of think um, Krennic and that type of stuff. And, and he's done pretty nicely in, in, in those archetypes, no doubt about it. I don't think he's been incredibly impressive. I think he's just been kind of generally solid. And I think that kind of fits him into B tier, probably a little bit better than uh long pike here but a little bit weaker than first light just because he's not really that as explosive especially since when you compare eight drops like eight resource plays that you can be making a lot of the times snoke just kind of isn't good enough to get you to the end of the game but he is good like it's not bad it's just not impressive enough Val's up next and uh this one's very very weird uh two four for two but she has this bounty or you could deal three damage to a unit and when she's defeated you get two experience tokens to a friendly unit this card has been worse than i was hoping for but not terrible i thought she was going to be really excellent but here's the way this bounty slash when defeated trigger works the active player gets to choose how to resolve abilities. So if you are the active player, or if you're trying to be the active player, you must use Val to trade into another unit. You must attack with Val. If your opponent attacks Val and kills her, then sh they get to go ahead and deal damage and or order the triggers as they want, which means that they could potentially kill something before you get the experience tokens to do so. But if you are trading with Val and let's say um, you attack in and you have like a 3-3 three, three on the battlefield, you can go ahead and give two experience tokens to it and then you can allow them to resolve their bounty, which means that your unit survives. So that's kind of interesting. The problem is, is that it does end up in inconsistent fashion and it can be very weak in some places, but also very strong in others, especially if you have grit synergies. As such, I'm going to go ahead and keep it probably just a little bit ahead of Long Pike because it is a two resource play, but I do think it ends up in B tier. Next one up, next one up, we got ourselves Ray. So Ray, five resource, uh, Vigilance, Heroism, four, seven. She is interesting as you can ignore her heroism aspect if you control Kylo Ren. This includes the leader as well, but the unit or leader. And then anytime you attack, you may heal two damage from a unit. And if it's a non-heroism unit, you also get a shield token on them. 
Uh, this card I'm not like super excited about, but it is just good. It is just good. Um, you can do, you know, Ray Green and ECL out a Ray, which can be kind of cool. You can go ahead and play Kylo Green and ECL out Ray, although I think that's a lot weaker. I think playing Ray in a Ray deck actually does benefit a lot because there's a lot of situations where they have high toughness and low power. So there is a lot of damage being taken also in any grit synergy if you want to go that direction then that also works kind of nicely where you're trying to take a lot of damage and then you play a ray uh, it's not like a card that i've been extremely impressed with and i think it's just good i think i'll have to put it nearing the top of b tier next on up we have mystic reflection uh this one is kind of like the make an opening um that uh that that you have in the new set this one's pretty weak uh one resource is kind of nice right anytime you see one resource you're like oh hold on let me let me take a look at this card again right because you're like oh maybe i can take get some major value when i just have that one resource sort of sitting around the problem with this is similar to like make an opening you do need to have a card that's actually like worth killing with this thing right um so there's not a lot of situations where you can actually kill something with um you know mystic reflection but uh on the same note you also have to have a force unit to even get the make an opening otherwise it's like a half of a disarm which is very weak we've already seen how weak disarm is um in the overall set so overall this one i'm actually gonna put in d tier i think it's actually one of the worst rares slash legendaries in the entire set um it is just so weak in that you don't really get any value you don't even get the heal from make an opening which is arguably the more important part about make an opening um there can be situations where you can play this and it does something but it's generally going to be replaced by so many different other options i think it's a card that you actually just should not actively put in your deck very 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 most of the time um, and you'll regret it when you do next one up we have survivor's gauntlet this one's kind of interesting because he's a four six space unit for five but you also get to attach an upgrade um, on a unit to another eligible unit controlled by the same player so this is really important right because it's not just yourself so you could actually mess up your opponent's sort of strategy if you have um an upgrade or if they have an upgrade that is on a specific unit that they want to keep on it like an experience token and their unit's about to die and if you remove the experience token it actually kills the unit that could be something kind of cool obviously the idea is that you can move your own upgrades around which is pretty nice overall i mean it's got decent stats and it has a, an okay ability it's just kind of weak like there are a lot of other five resource vigilance plays even though this has a decent stat line um the actual one played trigger which is interesting it's also an on attack trigger although it's interesting and it can do some fun things that's like very very rare that it actually does anything and because of that it's kind of a vanilla unit oftentimes i'm actually gonna have to drop into the c tier category it's a card that yes in the dream scenario you can move some stuff around it does some sweet stuff but overall it's pretty weak next one up we have sugi um this one is a pretty cool one she is a double vigilance for six and anytime she is actually upgraded she's actually a sentinel and she also has smuggle for only a single vigilance so she's kind of like a double vigilance single vigilance um type of card so she's a four six for four and uh, she can get sentinel if she's upgraded here's the thing um double vigilance is kind of a hard cost again i talked about this earlier with second chance there's a lot of situations where, um, you know, if this was a single Vigilance and you could play it in other shells, it would be a lot more exciting because, of course, paying six for her is just atrocious. Um, you don't want a six resource for six. Like, that's just not not great. Even, again, with the smuggle cost that she's a six resource for six. Not exciting. But if you could play, like, her Gar Saxon Green, for example, I'd be a lot more excited because there's a lot of upgrades being passed around. And a four six four is not bad stat line. Uh, all of that being said, and the last thing I, I said specifically, a 4-6 for 4 is not bad, and it's actually decent. So she doesn't, like, get the boot or anything. I actually think she's kind of on par um, with um, some of the cards that we've seen later on in the late B tier or even the higher end of C tier. As such, I'm going to put her at the higher end of C tier. I, heck, if you look at Lom Pike, he's a 4-6 for 4, and he has a relevant ability that actually does something um oftentimes where um this one also is restricted by the double vigilance cost and you don't really want to be playing double vigilance oftentimes yes you can you can certainly um, but it's generally not perceived as strong to go out and do that 
Evidence of the crime. This one is a sweet one. You get to take control of an upgrade that costs three or less and attach it to an eligible unit of your choice. Now, here's the important part about this one is if you're playing control deck, you have to move it to an eligible unit. So if you don't have a unit, it does nothing, which means that this is more of a sideboard card, but it is a very powerful one. And you might be surprised. This is the first A tier card that I'm gonna put on our list because evidence of the crime is one of the most powerful swingy cards that you could play especially when it comes out of the sideboard or heck even if you play like one to two copies in your main deck there are a lot more upgrades running around in the game right now there are things like jetpack things like jedi lightsaber things like shield tokens and experience tokens things like mandalorian armors uh things like boba fett's armor all these types of upgrades are running around right now and this is a card that just completely messes those up Heck, even if your opponent like goes turn one, play a um, Inferno 4. Turn two, they play a Devotion on their Inferno 4. You take that Devotion and put on whatever two drop you played on turn one, and suddenly you're feeling really good about that Evans the Crime because look, think about what that did. It killed your opponent's Devotion and then gave you a Devotion for three resources, which is really, really valuable. So this is uh, much more of a niche card, but it's an extremely powerful niche card, which is why it's more relegated to the sideboards, I would say. Um, but it is worth a tier just because of the power level of a card like this. Next one up, we have Chewbacca. Chewbacca, kind of the new Count Dooku. He's an eight resource, 410. That also gets to defeat a unit with five or less uh, remaining HP when he comes into play. And he has grit. Uh, this card, uh, I'm not sure if he's actually worth the A tier, honestly. Um, I'm going to put him in A tier because I've played a lot of Chewbacca. I played him in limited as well. I got lucky enough to get a limited Chewbacca. But the thing with um, Count Dooku that I really never liked was the four or less HP. The fact that Chewbacca hits five or less remaining HP is actually extremely relevant. And you'd be surprised how many additional things that you can hit with five or less remaining HP. Um, also, the fact that he's a 410 versus a 54 with shield, but he also has grit means that he can actually get in for a lot of damage and survive without, you know, just dying to like some random saboteur, which does run around quite frequently, even as the smuggle, although I don't think that's especially important. Uh, this guy is niche, but he is a very powerful niche card, I would say. And uh, he's been impressive so far. I think you could argue that he's been in like more of a B tier category, but I think uh, at least for me and uh, what I've seen in a lot of games, he can come down and actually do some major work. So I'm going to put him in the A tier for now. That's going to be wrapping up the Vigilance cards. You could see that honestly, most of them are like kind of mediocre, um, at least the rares and legendaries that is. So uh, hopefully we get some more powerful ones when we move on to command. And starting us off in command, we have Palpatine's Return. Now, uh, don't take this the wrong way, but I think Palpatine's Return is probably the most overrated or one of those overrated cards in the new set. This is a card that I myself was very excited about because you can obviously bring back things like Emperor Palpatine, Maul, Darth Vader. These are sweet cards to bring back from your discard pile. Two things about this card. One, there's not a lot of ways to get cards early on in your discard pile without your opponent actively trying to discard your cards like pillage or things, which is not normally what people are going to be doing. So you're not actually going to get the cards in your discard pile all that often. Two, even if you do, it's very inconsistent that you do. And three, oftentimes you don't even have the proper unit to go ahead and have value with this palpatine's return there are a lot of situations where like i would have played like a seven drop or a eight drop and i'll just palpatine's return it back um and uh i'm not getting any discount because it's not actually a force unit right like i need to have specific cards it just ends up being pretty mediocre heck i've even tried the kylo ren strategy of like actually being able to discard and that's just extremely weak that deck does not work nearly as well as double red kylo i think this card's actually like okay um, in specific things, it can do something, but it is so rare that it actually works out in your favor that I'd much rather just play a solid six resource play in my deck um, and not have to worry about all these things going wrong for it to, you know, end up being pretty mediocre. Next one up, we have General Riken. This one's a 5-7, really interesting when played on attack, essentially giving Sentinel, and then if it has Sentinel, it gives um, an experience token to it. Here's the problem with General Riken, and I think this is a big problem. He's in green, and he's a six drop, which means that he is competing with all the other six drops or five drops 
that can also be ECL'd out. Because whenever you're in green, you have to consider, okay, I have ECL and it's a six drop. Can I ECL this out for value? And that's oftentimes where green is being played. Right? If you look at green heroism, think about like Sabine green, Han green. Those are some of the most popular decks right now. Han green, especially. General Riken does not have an easy competition about uh, against any of the six drops in red, for example, that could also be ECL'd out, or even against the other six drops um, in green that could potentially be ECL'd out. Um, and uh, unfortunately for us, you know, that ends up being pretty mediocre um, in terms of comparing himself to the other options that we have in the card pool right now. And unfortunately for me, I, I haven't really actually been able to get this guy to really impress me. I've tried in a full Sentinel deck with things like Echo Base, things like, um, heck, even like Gamorrean Retainers and and obi-wans and things like that but he just ends up being okay not terrible okay i think being um probably at the end of b tier is actually okay for him for right now next up we got rule with respect this is a very impactful card but it is also very inconsistent for resources to have a friendly unit capture each enemy non-leader unit that attacked your base this turn or this phase so this card is really swinging of course if you can have the crazy turn where your opponent um attacks your base with three different units and you have one unit capture them all it can be kind of crazy right the problem is here's here well here's the few problems a you need your opponent to have attacked your base with multiple different units for this to actually capture more than one and remember we have other cards that capture just one unit for three resources so this needs to capture more than one to even be considered two your opponent actually needs to attack your base right? Not just your units, right? It's not just attacking and it needs to capture more than one, but it also needs to attack your base specifically. Three, you need a unit for this to actually do anything on the battlefield, which is really unfortunate. I don't like capture in general. And then four, you need to have not wanted to trade with your opponent's units at all. And your opponent needs to not have wanted to trade with your units at all for this to even do anything ever. This one to me is like a fat C tier. It's a card that can have a major, major swing, but usually does nothing. And heck, you can even kill the unit that captures all the units anyways and get all your units back with no damage on them. So pretty weak overall. Our Quintin's Assault Carrier is the next one up. This is a fatty. It's a 7-8 Ambusher in space. And anytime it defeats a non-leader unit, you get to go ahead and put that, um, put a unit um, into play as a resource, which is crazy in terms of ramping units, potentially things like Devastator. This is that's kind of where I've seen this card be used is like in a complete ramp deck where you're playing things like Devastator, maybe even a finalizer or something like that. And you want to ramp into those big, big cards even after you've ramped a good amount. And then you can get some value. Here's the problem with our Quintin's Assault Carrier. In games where your opponent's playing space units, this can do some major work. It kills something. It's a big space unit, can control space, can end the game quickly. If they don't play space units, it's an eight resource, seven, eight, which is like really bad. Like that is awful you don't want to be playing an eight resource seven eight in space you have so many other better options that do something on the board and like really impactful so it can swing the game if your opponent's playing space units and it can also do kind of nothing um and what i found is usually when i'm picking out my suite of expensive cards our quinton's assault carrier is like either the first that gets cut or not even considered i'm gonna have to drop it into kind of the middle of c tier it's okay if you can't if you want to play something that's expensive you can and uh, maybe it's even a little bit better in the sidebar but overall i've been very unimpressed with it next up we have choose signs you essentially get to swap an enemy a non-leader unit with a friendly non-leader unit this one is extremely swingy and uh this is another card where i look at and i'm like dang this card is a sweet card the problem is well many things one you need a leader uh, a unit that you don't care about two you need your opponent to have a, a unit that they care about Three, you need to actually get major value from swapping those two units. And four, your opponent needs to not also have a good follow-up afterwards, right? Because let's think about this. If you go, let's say, turn turn six or uh, six resources, you know, they play like a wrecker and they hit your units. And then you play whatever, like a two drop or something and a couple two drops and like a resupply or something. I don't care. And then next turn, you choose size. You trade your two drop for their wrecker. But remember, they've already got the when played trigger. And then they play a seven resource play, which is actually good. You've essentially traded, you paid seven resources for a half of a wrecker 
and you gave them one of your two drops and then they get to play another card afterwards with their seven resources yeah this card uh oh my gosh it has been pretty bad <laughs> um i've tried to make this to work um there are some situations where it can be sweet but overall this is a, a hopeful card and you don't want to be putting it in your deck um very frequently maybe it gets better in a sideboard but no nah, i've not been very impressed Cobb Vanth, a three resource, three, two. I was really impressed with this as we were seeing it in spoiler season. And honestly, it has been a little bit unimpressive, but still solid. The fact that you, um, you, you cannot play the card if your opponent has gone ahead and, well, killed it after you've already taken initiative is a little bit unfortunate. Um, and it doesn't replace itself. This is more of a sideboard card, I would say, against certain matchups where you can kind of get some value out of Cobb Vanth being a three, two anyways, and then uh, getting a two drop afterwards. I would say, though, the biggest restriction is that you need a two drop and you need enough two drops where this does not miss, which means you need to be playing like eight to 11 two drops in your deck for this to actually consistently hit. And that's a difficult you know, thing to do in a lot of different decks, because there are some decks that kind of cheat on cost. You're playing three drops as two drops. You're playing upgrades as two drops or events as two drops or whatever it is. I think he's solid and I think he's like a B tier, but I don't think he's exceptional like I thought he was going to be. Dark Saber. Um, this one is obviously a card that uh, I got to be careful about because it's one of people's favorites cards. And of course, I was very excited to see it in the Mandalorian when it did come. But uh, this one's a four resource upgrade that uh, is a plus four plus three. And you can go ahead and attach it to a non-vehicle unit and ignore any aspect if it's a Mandalorian unit. And anytime you attack, you give an experience token to all of your other Mandalorians, right? Pretty sweet. Here's the first thing that I really dislike about this card is that it doesn't actually do anything when you play it. If you were able to get an experience token to all your other Mandalorians when you play it, that could be something. Second, it doesn't actually buff up your own unit when you attack, so it can't give it to its own Mandalorian units, which is a little bit unfortunate. And third, there's not enough Mandalorians in the set to really think of that bonus as exciting. To me, this is oftentimes just a plus four, plus three upgrade. And if that's the case, it's just okay. It's good, it's just, not amazing there are often times where you'll have one mandalorian on the side after you put it on like a gar saxon or a sabine but if you think about it it's like let's say you're playing double red sabine which is like the most you know kind of mandalorian heavy thing that you could be playing i guess you could play sabine green let's say you're playing like sundari peacekeepers you're playing like sabine wrens you're playing um those types of cards and you go sabine wrens sundari peacekeeper turn three you deploy sabine you equip dark saber and boom suddenly you have two mandalorians you're giving experience tokens to that's like the ultimate best case scenario and it does do some good stuff there and it probably will win you the game um but there's also a chance that you could potentially just win the game if you played another four resource you know upgrade or potentially two two resources upgrades in general i think that this is a solid card and i would put it actually you know in b tier you know i think it's actually decent but I don't think it's exceptional. And uh, the cases where it's really good, it is good. And there are cases when, you know, it's just kind of plus four, plus three. It's just decent. It's not exceptional. It's just, you know, wow, that's that's good. Next up, we have Enterprising Lackeys, a four resource five, five with double command. And uh, basically when it's defeated, you can put it in your smuggle pile and re-smuggle it out later. The thing that I like about this is the four resource five, five, but that's basically all it's got going for it. Replaying it over and over again is not really something that's going to win you the game as far as I've found. And it is double command, which is a pretty big issue. It's okay. It's not amazing. I think this is a card that, you know, maybe could find some plays if you're playing like double green. Uh, I think it's like, okay, just the five, five stat line is something that is worth considering but there are a lot of other things that you could be doing and heck i don't even know if i, I want to put it in that uh, higher v tier i actually think i'm going to put it top of c tier right now probably behind sugi because i actually do like the four resource four six potential sentinel over enterprising lackeys but very similar cards i would say Next up, we have Ethent Mon, a really interesting card. It's five resource, four, six. And anytime you attack, you could choose an enemy non-leader unit um, that has attacked your base. And then you get to go ahead and have a friendly unit capture it. So similar to the rule with respect, but you also get a four, six body with it. Remember, you need to have an enemy unit attack your base. You need to have a friendly unit, right? It can be Ethent Mon, so that is something. And also you need to attack with this to get that trigger which means that if you don't ecl it out then your opponent knows it's coming i think this card's actually pretty mediocre it's not amazing it's not terrible it's just kind of whatever there are so many different other things that i'd rather ecl it out and if you're just playing as a five resource four six that's really understated to be honest 
<coughs> heck we have four resource five fives and four resource four six that are in the c tier right now the stats are not going to get it there and honestly capturing if you're putting it under effing mon that's not really a scary target and uh well if he comes down later on in the game then he's just going to get killed i think mean, this card is whatever it's i think a little bit better than something like enterprising lackeys it has a little bit more potential but i wouldn't put it you know past like i think actually the end of b tier is as far as i can go with this card next up we have finalizer oh man people are gonna hate me for this one it's 11 resources and 11 11 with overwhelm and anytime you play this you choose any number of friendly units and you are able to go ahead and capture that many enemy units uh non-leader units in the same arena so if you choose you know let's say you have two ground units two space units boom you get to capture two ground units and two space units it's sick right really crazy play this card b tier <laughs> I've tried it, guys. I've tried playing Finalizer. This is a card that does not actually make you allow you to come back in a game where you're losing, right? Because you play it in space and you could only capture a space unit. It's not a card that helps you finish out the game any better necessarily than something like a Devastator, which comes down a turn earlier and actually guarantees that that card is removed permanently. It's not really a card that's necessary in general. In fact, most games are ended on nine resources and eight resources not at 11 right when you put a crate dragon into play or you put a darth vader in the mall in the reinforcement walker into relentless or something like that those are things that just kind of end the game finalizer is so much extra and that's the problem with this card i play with finalizer i play with like two copies of it in like a lot of my ramp decks i played at least one copy in a lot of my ramp decks as you all have seen and i haven't even been able to really play this card because it's so expensive and it ends up just really doing nothing and heck i don't even think that the effect is that much better for 11 resources than something like a devastator which is guaranteed to kill something forever so that is something to consider and again i want to stress this one of the reasons why i think devastator is a lot better is because um you could also kill ground units with it whereas finalizer if it's the only unit you have you cannot kill a ground unit with it you just have to let it hit you because it's not in the same arena as it so unfortunate but d tier marauder Ooh, this one is a sweet one four five ambusher space units and when you played you choose a card in your discard pile and you put it into a resource or into play as a resource if it shares a name with a unit you control this one actually just an a tier i think it's just solid uh honestly the when played ability not really that re re relevant but it is a five resource four five heroism village uh command card that has a keyword which works with boba fett which is relevant it's just kind of a solid card and there are a decent amount of times where i've you know had some sort of you know synergy with the when play where i have some card in my discard pile and have a um a unit that shares a name like let's say i played a marauder it traded with something and then i play another marauder boom suddenly i get to go ahead and get that resource into play something like that it has happened a couple of times but really it's just a five resource four or five space unit and uh, that's good enough right it acts as a removal card that ends up kind of closing out the game and there are a decent amount of space units that are in the game right now and four power is usually enough to kind of take them out i've been happy with the card let's just say that Next up, we have Legal Authority. And out of any of the capture cards, this is the card that I'm most excited about. I think this card is the best capture card that we have in the whole set too. You get to attach it to a friendly unit and attach unit captures enemy non-leader unit with power less um, than it. So that is an important distinction. You do need to have a certain amount of power on a unit for this to actually go ahead and capture something, but it gives your unit plus zero plus two and it's also two costed so there are some capture mechanics or capture events in the game that you know um give you like no restrictions like tape cap uh, take captive for example this one prevents you um, from going after really high power things but it gives your unit a buff and really the deck that i've been really impressed with legal authority in is kira because she gets shield tokens and then you get to put legal authority on them and protect them with another shield token because it was plus zero plus two this card is actually in some cases really annoying to deal with heck if you put it on your um leader you get a plus zero plus two and grant chances are they have four to five power you can capture some decent things um think about this as like a takedown uh where you are killing the earlier stuff or like a fell the dragon where you're gonna, gonna be able to get those types of cards where maybe not fell the dragon because that's five or more but you know the earlier game removal cards and that's what a legal authority is it's not like a late game removal card 
Next up, we have Inspiring Mentor. Uh, plus one, plus one, and on attack, when defeated, give an experience token to another friendly unit. Whew. Oh, man, this card has just been pretty mediocre. Let's just say that. I have been kind of sad with this card. It is an interesting effect. You get some, you know, general value from it. You get a plus one, plus one on your unit. Yeah, all well, that's good. Here's the thing. You need another friendly unit, and you need this thing not to die, Okay. Um, yes, you can go ahead and they can kill it and you get another experience token, which is something. Um, but uh, what I found is that the problem is that you need another unit. Okay. And if you are like turn two, you've played a unit, you play Inspiring Mentor. Chances are your opponent's going to find a way to deal with that. And that's really unfortunate. And if you do have another unit, great. You kind of play two resources to get an experience token. Maybe, maybe you trade it up and uh, they had to use a more expensive card to deal with it but that's honestly kind of like whatever it's not amazing but it's not terrible it's just mediocre as i said earlier so i think it kind of fits into this b tier category um i don't want to put it at the end of b tier because i do think that there are some draws that is really explosive and i have had that a couple times where you go like turn one play a one drop play a one drop turn two play an inspiring mentor heck even another one drop like hyper aggressive decks i played it i tried to play in like boba fett with like clone deserters and like reckless gunslingers and and um r2d2s and that was okay um so there are games where it's decent i think it kind of fits into like this middle tier of b tier um i think i'm okay with that Next up, we have Maz Kanata, another card where a lot of people have been excited about, but I have found to be okay. Not amazing. Okay. Uh, I have tried the Han Green, where you play Maz Kanata and you're able to play these expensive cards more frequently getting the experience tokens. Here's the thing. If Maz Kanata ends up being a one resource 2-2, two, two, not good enough. It's a If it's a one resource 3-3, three, three, it's good enough. That's the baseline, right? Because we play things like Greedo and Death Star Stormtrooper because they have three powers so they could actually trade with things. Because a lot of the times your opponent could potentially just kill Maz Kanata and not really have to worry about it. Heck, if you play Maz Kanata and you're against like a boss and they put a bounty on your thing, oof, nightmare scenario, right? This card, in some scenarios, when you do have that nut curve where you go Han Solo, Maz Kanata, R2, or you can even go like Maz Kanata, R2 plus another one drop, uh, that is absurd, right? You can go like Maz Kanata plus A-Wing and they go into space or something like that and your Maz Kanata can live so she can power up. There are scenarios where she actually does end up being pretty good. And uh, uh, there have been scenarios where I have had that happen. But generally speaking, generally speaking, um, this is a car that uh, doesn't actually do that. And so middle of B tier, a little closer to the higher end is fine with me. Next one up, we have Endless Legions, and oh my gosh, this is probably my favorite pet card from the new set. I've tried to make Endless Legions work. Guys, if you saw my video, spoiler alert, I played like 30 or 40 games, and I could not actually play Endless Legions a single time. I got to like 14, 15 resources sometimes, but oftentimes those are the games where I had to resource Endless Legions early to actually get to that resource amount. And most of the time where I was at 14 or 15 resources, I could have ended the game sooner. This is an absolute meme card. Um, this is a card that like you look at and you're like, okay, yeah, I could play it, but it's like, do I want to? Probably not because I could just win the game before then. Uh, maybe, maybe you could say, oh, well, I could play it in a sideboard scenario where I'm playing Endless Legions as my sideboard against control decks. Well, guess what? You could also just bring in things like Re Relentlesses um, and, and deal with control decks a little bit better in that stage of the game or like reinforcement walkers and draw cards out of it, that type of scenario. So Endless Legions, D tier, this is a card you just should not play ever. And here's an exciting one, Maul, okay? And I'm not gonna waste any time, guys, Maul, s tier card this is a card that i actually prefer over vader in a lot of scenarios a seven six ambush overwhelm here's the keyword overwhelm is crazy this actually helps you kill people way quicker than something like a vader does vader more board presence of course and oftentimes hits something like a phase three dark trooper which gives you sentinel and if you're able to hit that frequently and you're able to get that scenario going uh, when you want that board presence it can potentially be better to play vader and that's where i like this it kind of fits in that same slot as vader but if you want to be a little bit more aggressive and and here's the important factor if you have underworld cards he gets even better because what you can do with this thing is like pass the damage on to other cards and you can just keep attacking with this guy for massive chunks of damage and actually get into their base and kill their units this card has been absolutely amazing and a card that i would definitely put in the s tier as my first s tier card um i've been very impressed with maul and 
I just honestly see this guy and I'm like, ooh, yeah, I'm going to drop a couple of them in my deck because I'm a mid-range deck and he's going to be like kind of the closer. That's kind of what you do with Darth Vader. And now I do like a 2-1 split. Like some decks have two Vaders, one Maul. Some decks have two Mauls, one Vader. Even though he's a seven cost card, I still want to play a couple copies of him because he's just so, so powerful. That's going to wrap up the command cards and uh, well, shaping up our list, guys. We only have one S tier card so far. Let's move on to aggression all right everyone so here is where we get to at least in my opinion the real good stuff i think aggression is a little bit stacked this uh this set uh, at least in terms of what cards you actually got perhaps you know some cards will go higher up in the list as we get more you know decks introduced and the set kind of actually gets itself situated and tournaments start to be played but anyways we're gonna start ourselves off with Costca reeves this is a pretty interesting one um, as uh, you get a four or five that if it's upgraded, you get to do some extra damage. Honestly, a four resource, four or five, solid. Nothing to really complain about there. Um, four, six is obviously better. Five, five is obviously better, right? Um, but this actually does have a, a relevant ability where you actually do oftentimes get some upgrades in the kind of heroism red decks and you can do some two damage but unfortunately it doesn't really play out that way all that often uh, the fortunate thing about it is that she is a mandalorian and there are a lot of ways to kind of get random upgrades for example if you play the mandalorian deck you can dark saber give her an experience token and boom suddenly she is upgraded so there are some random ways to get experience and if you are able to do two damage to a ground unit it, it can do decently it's not amazing and honestly, it's not that much better than something like a Sugi or Enterprising Lackeys. Of course, one of the big downsides for them is the fact that they are double of their uh, of their aspect. Um, so I'm gonna have to put her probably just like eh, above like Effet Mon. Not amazing, not terrible. However, here is the big boy crate dragon. Where is he gonna end up? Where is he gonna? Oh yeah, that's right. S S triple S tier. Arguably one of the best cards from the new set and that's why they're in s tier crate dragon has spawned a million different archetypes we have like han green mid-range ramping the crate dragons we have vader greens ramping the crate dragons we have palpatine reds ramping the crate dragons we have um all these different decks ramping the crate dragons because it's so oppressive in basically any matchup that maybe isn't aggro but all um, any matchup that uh that is trying to fight aggro doesn't really want expensive cards in their deck anyway so i mean that's not really a huge knock against crate dragon but if you're playing this against mid-range like if your opponent tries to play an answer to it like a car like a creature or a unit or something you can just kill it or you can hit their base if your opponent's playing control you hit their base you hit their base over and over again it just ends the game if you have multiple copies it just ends the game crate dragon is arguably one of the biggest payoffs we've seen for ramping and uh people are taking advantage of it it's also nine resource 10 10 overwhelm if you look at the nine resource plays like for example, um, something like Avenger that comes down, right? You're like, okay, Avenger? Yeah, that's a good card. It's nine resources. It's an 8-8 eight, eight space unit. Defeats something when it comes into play. Like, that's pretty good, right? This is better than Avenger, and I would have put Avenger probably in close, closer to like A tier probably in the last set, but um, still an excellent, excellent card. And yet, Crate Dragon, in my opinion, just is better because ironically, if your opponent plays a card, it acts as a removal card um because you can hit their their units and again you can just hit their base for a million points of damage which is just crazy s tier for the crate dragon next up we have kylo ren mm. kylo ren six seven six resources can be ecl'd and if you play ray you can ignore his aspect i will say that uh, unlike kylo who doesn't really care about be being able to play ray in his deck um ray does actually care about kylo ren being played in her deck and uh, i actually would play kylo ren in her deck and, and, and get some value out of him giving the plus two plus zero oh, and uh, potentially plus three plus one if it's a non villainy unit if it's being played in ray it will be is actually pretty good and uh, i've been decently impressed with ray or uh, kylo i actually think he probably ends up in like the lower end of a tier if you're able to play this guy and maybe get one attack off of him he's really really good and uh, he is worth being ecl'd out because remember if it's a non-villainy unit you get an experience token plus the plus two plus oh and so you can like ecl this guy let's say a uh, guy out like in ray green and then give plus three plus one essentially to one of your other units and that could be a really impactful thing and you get to ambush and you potentially can attack with him again and again and get more experience tokens going so he snowballs very quickly but honestly, if you get one attack off of this guy, it's really good. And he's also a six resource, six, seven. So he's usually not going to die immediately. Um, 
you know, if you look at like Maul, for example, he lines up pretty badly against Maul. <laughs> I guess not badly because he actually trades, but um, that's kind of the advantage of Kylo is, is, is he actually really has a very powerful on attack trigger, but he also has pretty good stats to stay alive until then. Next up, we have Pre Vizsla, a pretty interesting one. Seven resource, eight, seven when played on attack. Um, you can go ahead and pay a cost and and uh, do some crazy things with with upgrades. Here's the thing with Pre Vizsla. Um, this guy is unfortunately um, really only good where you can kind of pay the cost of upgrades and take control of these upgrades. Maybe you could defeat some upgrades, but usually it's going to be taking control of upgrades. He's a seven resource, eight, seven, and he can't be ECL'd, but he is a when played trigger. If your opponent's playing upgrades, this guy's actually pretty good. It's a situation where if your opponent's playing, you know, like the, the Gar Green deck, Gar Saxon Green, and your opponent plays a Dark Saber and you play this guy um, and you can go ahead and steal a Dark Saber, it's great. But think about this for a second. You need to have play pre Vizsla, and then you have to pay four resources on top of that to go ahead and steal the dark saber when you play him so really in my opinion what happens or at least what i've seen is that it's more of an on attack trigger when played you steal shield tokens and experience tokens on attack is when you can actually steal upgrades from your opponent so overall it's like when played take an experience token from your opponent and then on attack you get to take their big things right if your opponent is playing a lot of upgrades, he's not bad. Um, he kind of situates himself in like the middle of B tier. He's a very good top end threat for those types of decks where um, you're playing upgrades, your opponent's playing upgrades, and it kind of finishes the deal. Although a lot of upgrade decks aren't playing red. Um, so just something to keep in mind. Next one up, we have ourselves Poe Dameron. And ooh, 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 ooh. yeah, S tier, just an S tier. Think about this, guys. He's a five resource, six, six. That's crazy. That's like so much more stats than we're used to seeing. If you look at five resources in set one, you're thinking like Zeb and Zeb was perfectly playable. In fact, it was one of the mirror breakers for like Sabine Green, right? Now you have Poe Dameron, who's a five resource six, six with an insane on attack trigger. And to be honest, I wasn't sure how powerful the on attack trigger was going to be, you know, discarding a bunch of cards and getting minor effects, but versatile effects didn't seem amazing to me. Here's the thing. You get the two damage and he can attack for eight into a base. That's really good on five resources. He's hyper aggressive, but also really, really kind of mid range good card as well. I've seen him in Han Greens being deployed for four resources as a six four, which is crazy. I've seen him being played in like Boba Greens. I've seen him played in Sabine Greens, ECLing him out. He is exceptional. And he is a card that is defining kind of red heroism right now alongside one other card that is just kind of making red heroism really oppressive. And it's one of the reasons why we're seeing Han everywhere. Think about it, guys. Why is Han good? Why, why do you think Han's good? It might be because they're playing Crate Dragons and Poe Dameron's, the best cards in the set. I don't know. Maybe maybe that's why it's good. <laughs> Next one up, we have Ruthlessness, a one resource upgrade that gives plus two plus oh. And when this unit attacks it and defeats a unit, deal two damage to the base. This card, I think, is kind of having an identity crisis. You get plus one, plus two, plus oh, which is okay, right, to help you defeat units. The problem is when you're playing an upgrade that aggressive, you usually want to hit their base, and you don't want to be wasting your unit on another unit to deal two damage to the base. If this gave, like, plus one, plus one, I actually would be more excited about Ruthlessness because the thing with this is that you actually have to kill a unit and you want your unit to live. Because if you put Ruthlessness on a unit and then you end up trading with that unit... Um, with an enemy unit. Well, you just traded two cards for one, essentially, which is a very bad deal. Yes, you get two damage to their base, but you lost your unit, which probably can get you more damage in the long run. So the fact that this doesn't give, it, doesn't give toughness is a little bit weak. I have played a little bit in Kylo Red and uh, potentially some other uh, aggro decks, maybe, but uh, I've not been very impressed with it. I'm actually going to drop it into C tier, and I think it's actually like meh, not amazing. Maybe one copy in like Kylo. Uh, it can get some use there, but even then, I oftentimes just resourced it and didn't actually see it be that impressive. Um, there are some matchups where it can be good, uh, especially against like Rays, but outside of that, it's it's kind of mediocre. And honestly, probably going to head and and and, and resourcing it every time. <laughs> Next up, we have Stolen Land Speeder. This one's pretty sweet. Very unique mechanic where it gifts to an opponent. 
Honestly, though, uh, I've not really been impressed with Stone Land Speeder. It is a one resource 3-2. And yes, if you are a hyper aggressive deck and you are playing multiple one drops, then you can go like Stone Land Speeder, Death Star Stormtrooper. And if your opponent doesn't trade um, with your Death Star Stormtrooper, then you essentially get to get a 4-3 for turn one, right? Because you, well, you, you get to get the Stone Land Speeder back. Um, but you also have to trade your 3-1 for it. Like, let's say you, you play two drops, two one drops. You play the Stone Land Speeder and the Death Star Stormtrooper. You essentially paid two cards on turn one for a 4-3 on turn three because it's not going to be able to attack your opponent until turn three. And there's a chance that your opponent can actually attack you with the damage. So there are only a few decks where I found this good. In fact, maybe only one deck, and that's Bosk because you can immediately ping the Stolen Land Speeder when you play the Stolen Land Speeder, and then you can follow it up with another ping from Bosk. So you get to go ahead and just instantly claim that bounty, and you get a 4-3 essentially for free on turn two, which is pretty good. So uh, this is a very niche card, but good in that specific niche. I think it ends up in like the closer to the end of bottom tier of B. Next up, we have Wild Rancor, a six resource, six, eight overwhelm, but also deals two damage to each other ground units. Uh, double uh, double aggression is pretty harsh on this card because a lot of the double aggression decks, if you think like Kylo Red, if you think like Sabine Red, the decks are extremely low to the ground and do not care about a Wild Rancor. In fact, dealing two damage to other ground units is probably a downside in that type of deck, and it just doesn't get to six resources. So double aggression really hurting this card. Because any other thing like double command, double uh, vigilance, you can get to six resources. But double aggression is a situation where six resources is like very top end, where you probably don't even reach that point. So um, to me, I've tried this out. It's definitely like a mediocre card. Kind of situates itself a little bit on the higher end of C tier because it does do some things. Um, it's just not really meant for that specific kind of deck. Next up, we have Vambrace Flamethrower. This is a card that I really like in the sideboard in some specific matchups where upgrades are nice. Here's the problem with this, though, is where upgrades are good, usually you're not playing red. And so it's kind of like a sideboard card that doesn't really have a home. So it's kind of like, yeah, it is a cool card. And yes, it does some cool work, especially if you have, you know, ground units to divide the damage up and get some major value. The other problem I guess you could say with this card is it doesn't give a lot of stats for three resources. Like if you look at like Jedi lightsaber, it gets plus three, plus three. If this gave plus two, plus two and the effect, it'd be a lot higher on it. But for right now, it's just kind of mediocre. And uh, again, the best case scenario is that it's kind of good in certain sideboard scenarios. And even then it's pretty rare. So uh, to be honest, this is kind of like a middle of C tier type of card and uh, maybe even closer to the bottom of C tier. But anyways. Next up, we have Chaos of War. This is a card that I was really high on when I was in the kind of spoiler season. Uh, I, I thought it was going to be like S tier. You know, this is going to be the new Fora Cause. It's going to be super good. We're going to have double red decks because Fora Cause is going to get a lot worse because there's so many cards that are non heroism that you're going to want to be playing. It turns out that this card usually hits for like two damage rather than, or two or three rather than three or four, which is a good drop worse than, um, than Fora Cause. But that doesn't mean it's like, not good i think it's still you know in the a tier category but it is weaker than i had expected it to be um again if you're getting two to three damage versus three to four that's that is a decent chunk worse like that one point of damage does matter uh, there are some matchups where it can be absolutely devastating where you're dealing five i've had that happen to me multiple times when i'm playing like a more controlling deck or heck i've played like i tried to play vader blue again which by the way is a lot worse now um and i'll put like a uh, i am your father and your opponent's like yeah draw three cards and they fall out with like a chaos of war and they hit me for like eight that's like whoa dude that's crazy so yes it can have absurd scenarios but i think on average it's hitting for like two to four is is what it's hitting for and usually it's like three damage but Overall, still good, just not insane like I thought it was going to be. Given to your anger. Oh man, this is a card where it's just like, it does not have a place right now. This, you know, dealing one damage to an enemy unit and then forcing it to attack your units, it's just so mediocre. It doesn't, it's just so specific and it ends up doing like nothing 90% of the time. And then 10% of the time where it's good, you could have just played like a force throw or so, like something other than this. And it would have done something bigger uh, depending on your deck. This to me is like, maybe someone's found a, play, a spot for this and I'll bite my words. Cause this is a card that honestly I've played with like, uh, like 10 times uh, or in like 10 different matches in the decks I was playing. And I, every single time I saw I'm like resource, don't want that resource. Cause it just didn't do anything. And so for me, D tier. This is a card that you probably shouldn't be putting in your deck. 
Um, but at least it does have something to do rather than like choose sides or endless legion. <laughs> Heroic Resolve. Okay. This is a card that I thought was going to replace Heroic Sacrifice, or at least take some of the positions of Heroic Sacrifice, and it did do that. Uh, I usually like playing a split of Heroic Sacrifice and Heroic Resolve. Anytime Heroic Resolve is good, usually Heroic Sacrifice, or anytime Heroic Sacrifice was good, Heroic Resolve is usually pretty good as well. The problem with this is um, the secondary action of it, of dealing plus four, getting plus four, plus oh, and overwhelm, and hitting for a ton, is too expensive usually so it's oftentimes a one resource plus one plus one and your opponent just kind of trades with it which is a little bit weak and then the situations where you do get that plus four plus oh off um it's kind of just like a little bit awkward a little bit more awkward than i expected it to be and your unit oftentimes ends up dying anyways because you're overwhelming right it is good and honestly i think it kind of goes in the same spot as like chaos of war where it's not as good as i thought it was i don't think it's as good as heroic sacrifice actually and i generally prefer heroic sacrifice over heroic resolve um in my red decks but it's still good and i actually do like playing a copy of it in a, a lot of my uh heroism aggro decks next one up we have hotshot deal 44 blaster Oh man, this card is in S tier, guys. A little bit worse than the other ones we have here. Maybe argument for high A tier. But the tricky part about this card is it's not actually a red card. It's actually a cunning card. It's actually a yellow card. Because you're really not oftentimes playing this for one resource from your hand. Because you don't actually get the secondary effect of this. So when you play it from your hand, all you get is plus two plus O for one resource. And if you look at that, you're like, oh. Well, isn't that just, you know, ruthlessness, which is down here? Yeah, and that's probably where it would be if that's all you got. The thing is, when you are smuggling this, it is so good. Because the problem with a lot of tempo decks and cunning decks in specific is that you run out of gas in the middle of the game. And then this is like kind of the perfect finisher because you smuggle it for three resources and then you can immediately attack with the unit that you play it on. It kind of acts as your other copies of Surprise Strike, but it comes from your resource pile, which is really, really cool. And it also just permanently pumps your units. So your opponent could potentially just have to trade with it instead of just, you know, getting your opponent killed and, and keeping their units. This is a surprisingly good card and probably the best smuggle card we have from the uh, this set. And arguably one of the only cards that's actually worth playing from the smuggle pile. Next up, we have Django Fett. This is a card that's really good in specific decks, but also really just a big stinker in other ones. Four resource, three, six, does not have a good starting stat line um, in terms of aggressive stats, right? You really want that fourth point of power when you're talking about four, you know, resources invested into it. And uh, unfortunately for us, um, it does not have that. However, what it does have is when you attack a unit with bounty, it gets plus three, plus oh, an overwhelm. So it's a six, six overwhelm. And when you attack and defeat a unit, you get to draw a card. So here's where it's really good. Jabba obviously makes this thing really good. And it's one of the only reasons why you would consider playing Jabba Red. Um, Bosk, if you're playing a lot of bounties in Bosk, it's really good with Django, especially because Bosk can play ECL and you can go ECL hang out Django Fets, which is really good. Outside of that, I haven't really been that impressed with it. And to be honest, even in the Bosk deck, which I did play three copies of Django Fett, I didn't find myself ECLing out Django Fett all that often because I'd rather ECL out one of my five or six draw plays instead. So to me, this is kind of like a middle of the pack, like good, very good in that specific scenario, but also does not actually do all that much in a lot of other scenarios. So to be honest, middle of B tier, I think is a good spot for Django Fett. Kylo's TIE Silencer. So this is uh, probably one of the most unassuming legendaries in the whole game. It has a cool effect where if you've discarded this card, uh, this card from your hand or deck this phase, you can play it from your discard pile. Really cool with Kylo's ability, right? Honestly, I've played it in Kylo and yes, it is good in Kylo, but honestly, you don't really actually use the ability all that often. You're just discarding random cards to get an extra damage. It doesn't need to be a TIE Silencer. And yes, you can play it. And yes, it does do some stuff, but it really doesn't need to be. It's really just a two resource, three, two space unit. And it's an aggressive space unit for the, the decks that care about it. So it's just kind of a, 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 a good unit. You know, it's kind of like a battlefield brain, that type of stuff, right? Where you're just playing it on two resources and you're happy playing it on two resources. So to me, it's kind of like lower end or B tier. Uh, it's a card that you're not really going to see uh, be all that exciting, but it's a card that does make a lot of decks and actually, you know, is ex like good for your curve. And hoo hoo hoo. Oh boy, guys, we got ourselves Wrecker. Oh man, where am I going to put Wrecker? Oh, boop. I think Wrecker is the best card, maybe, 
I'm, I'm, I'm put my pin in it. Maybe best card. One of the best cards, if not the best cards in the entire set to release. This card is the king of ECL. We talked about how Maul has overwhelm and how it does so much damage. We talked about Poe Dammer has a great ECL target and how, you know, you get to go ahead and, and get some value, potentially kill some stuff. We talked about Crate Dragon as a great ramp target, but guess what Wrecker does? He comes down. If you ECL him, he can resolve the when played ability before ambush, which means, and this is really important, if your opponent has a six toughness unit, let's say, and they go play it and you play Wrecker ECL, you get to deal five damage to that unit and then hit it with Wrecker, which this means that it's essentially playing like two four causes in that turn because you deal six damage to their base. But you also keep your seven six or at that point, probably like a seven one or seven two with Overwhelm behind. It's crazy. Wrecker has absolutely changed heroism aggro for, well, in some people's cases, for the worst, because it has just made it so much more powerful. When we saw Wrecker, we were looking at this card and we're like, this card is absurd. We all knew the card was absurd. Dealing five damage when he comes into play, crazy, even at the cost of defeating a resource, which doesn't really matter in your aggro decks because six resources is kind of the top end of the curve. But even in like Han, where you were kind of trying to ramp, like Han mid range, where you're trying to ramp, Wrecker's still amazing. He's a he's a a five resource play potentially in some decks, um, or in Han decks if you want to get him down early in the mid range deck, or if you're playing aggro, you can play him as a seven four that deals five damage. Like it's so crazy, Wrecker is so good, guys. If you haven't played with Wrecker, please, please, please play with Wrecker. This card is so broken, it is ridiculous. Specifically with ECL, but also just in general inside the game. Migs Mayfeld. Okay, this is a card that literally is just trash unless you're playing Kylo. Yes, it says when a player discards a card from their hand, so it does work with something like Force Throw. But honestly, this card is really just a Kylo specialist, and he is very good in Kylo, as uh, you have seen in my Kylo Red decks. In specific scenarios, you play Migs Mayfeld, and you get some more damage than you ever would have expected with any other two drop in the game um, with Kylo, because, you know, you start discarding cards, he does an extra two damage from that, and it's like, it's really, it gets really crazy really quickly, but, and here's the problem, it's only Kylo, and even in Kylo, there are some spots where you want to resource him in, depending on the matchup, okay? So, to me, he's firmly in the B tier, because he does something absurd for, for a specific deck, but it's very niche, so I can't really bring myself to bring him, like, past, like, the very bottom of B tier. Um, even though he's sweet in Kylo, he's only for Kylo, and he doesn't really do anything else, so, bottom of B tier here. And that's going to wrap up aggression, guys. Uh, I hope you guys weren't uh, too sad to see all the aggression cards fly up into S tier. I do think aggression is a little stacked this set, uh, but we're going to dive into uh, cunning next and hopefully it's got a couple cards in s tier as well s tier as well so to start us off here we have bazine natal and uh, i think a lot of people were really excited about this card i was always kind of iffy on the card and the more i play with bazine natal the more i played against bazine natal i have just been super super unimpressed this is a card where you play it and yeah you take a card and i draw another card and it's like whatever sure you you, you played a one three that didn't really actually do anything in my game plan the one time or the times that Bazinatal actually does something is when you're doing it on an important turn these are turns like the record turn or the podamron turn or the vigilance turn where it's like turn five and your opponent has six resources and you expect them to be trying to ecl out a record and you play a Bazinatal for two resources or you smuggle it out in order for them to for you to take away that play from them because that's one of the game winning plays that they can make that's where Bazine Natal becomes good, but it's a very specific scenario, and she's not, like, better than that. She is a firm B tier for me at the, like, middle to lower end of B tier. I don't play more than one to two copies in a deck, and that's where she sits for me. Boba Fett's Armor. This is one of the most powerful upgrades in the whole game, but it only works on Boba Fett. Here's the thing with this card, is that if you have it, it does do some major things with Boba Fett. Now, it does work with Boba Fett leaders. So there's two of them. And it also works with the Boba Fett unit. Here's the thing with one of the Boba Fett leaders, the new Boba, which is green. You usually don't want to be playing yellow. So it's really only for the Boba unit, the three, five, and the big Boba, or, or, or the, the king of all Bobas, the four, seven for five. And it's very good. I, I honestly would put it in like the kind of bottom 
uh, area of A tier. This is a card where in certain matchups, Boba Fett becomes unkillable and unbeatable, right? It's just unbeatable. I've had many matchups where I would go, you know, flip Boba Fett, attack, put Boba Fett's armor on him, and it's a 6-9, and you're like, oh, geez, how do I kill with that? Or deal with that they i've had people like flip vader and, and do the mistake of attacking boba fett and deal two damage to him which does zero and it does three because vader only does three damage i've had people try to ambush him with vader and it does three damage it's just so crazy especially with an impactful leader like boba if we were like talking um a different leader like i don't know what's like a mediocre leader uh like a, a cheer or something i don't know a leader that comes down on five resources but doesn't have it as, as absurd of a stat line as boba boba fett's armor would be a lot weaker um and so this is really conducive because boba is such a strong leader and you do really want to keep him on the battlefield to leverage all the additional resources and he kind of can put the nail in the coffin i will say um this is a little bit more of a boba green card because boba yellow can kind of just tempo out people even easier so bottom of eights here but still a good good card omega oh man uh this card does basically nothing it's a two resource two two and yeah you can ignore all the aspect penalty on the first clone unit you play each round but like there's not actually a lot of clone units to play and uh you must have omega otherwise all those clone units that you're playing off aspect are now just garbage and also you can search the top five cards for a clone unit but you're probably gonna miss half the time if not more heck if this was a 2-2 that you know guaranteed me a card off the top five cards i probably still wouldn't play it this is a card where i've been very unimpressed with and i think it firmly sits at like the bottom of c tier it's just so mediocre the first line of text on it might be better in the later you know sets where we actually have a lot of clones to play with especially the next set because it seems to be more of a clone focus set but right now it is just super super bad kira is a lot more interesting she's a four resource three five that essentially gives you kind of like the um um oh my gosh i forgot the the card in magic but the um the stupid three mana flyer three one that looks at your hand but anyways you have to look at an opponent hand uh opponent's hand and you get to name a card and now all the cards uh with the same name um that that they have cost three more to play pretty interesting effect and i like to see them kind of print these unique effects uh for the game because i think um that's really exciting going forward here's the problem with this card is that yes you can mess up sometimes what your opponent's doing right uh by making it cost three more and now they can't make that play a lot of the times what ends up happening is your opponent can just play something different and you've played a four resource three five heck even if you do play the three five uh four resource three five and you do mess up what they're playing um and they can't actually play something else there are sometimes when they can just kill kira and it's not doing too much overall though i've actually been on the more impressed side of kira even though i did say some you know big downsides with her she is a tempo card and she does what she's trying to do i actually think she's pretty reasonable i'm gonna put her in the a tier i think that when you're playing like han and you get this down on turn three or turn two and uh, you mess with your opponent's curve and you have a like an oversteaded body for that point in the game yeah she can do some work so a tier a tier a tier swoop down swoop down swoop down pretty good card overall niche you must have a lot of space units in order for this to do anything. And even if you do, you must have a space unit that can attack a ground unit. So your opponent must have a ground unit. And on top of all that, you're going to want a, a space unit that can actually kill your opponent's ground unit. So you need to have a high powered uh, space unit. Overall, I thought this was going to be a pretty powerful card in something like Boba. But the thing with Boba is that you can just kill your opponent. There's no need to try to play these swoop downs and nonsense to try to get your opponent's ground units. You can just kill your opponent especially with something like a Fett's Fire Spray. Um, you can do some cool things like a 7th Fleet Defender and, and kill something and keep it around because it's got Shield Token. Overall, though, pretty mediocre card. I would probably put it at like the closer to the end of B tier um, where it's it's not doing all that much. And honestly, where we thought it was going to be good is, is not as good as we thought. Final Showdown. Oh, man, this is a sweet card. And this is a card, uh, Double Cunning. And as we've talked about with other Double Aspect cards, it's really hard to look at these cards because you know that the only option that they have is playing all cunning cards. And then you look at it and you're like, oh, wow, this doesn't really work with a lot of things that I'm hoping for. The deck that I really think this has a chance in is Boba Yellow. And I have played a lot of Boba Yellow and it is still a very good deck. But the problem with this is that when you look at six resources, guess what you could play with six resources? A Fett's Fire Spray 
And do you want to be playing this without a Fetz Fire Spray on the battlefield? Probably not, because you probably don't have enough damage to get in. So while this can do some cool things, I think it's much more of a win more card. I think the only time that I've seen this do some major work is when I'm against another aggro deck and they're about to end me and I can ready up everything and attack them and finish them out that turn where they could not have finished me out that turn, but they were going to have the advantage on the following turn. That's as far as I've got with Final Showdown. I think this is a C tier card. I think this is a card, uh, unfortunately, that uh, does not really have a place in the game right now. Um, and uh, I'm really hoping that it might in the future. Maybe Boba Yellow will actually find a place for it and uh, and maybe pick out some other cards that might be a little bit weaker. Dr. Evazan, okay. This is probably the most played card out of the new set besides like Wrecker and Podamron. And I say that because I, I, I don't say that as well as Podamron and Wrecker, as in like, I, I think people should not be playing Dr. Evazan. I think people play Cunning Villainy and they're like, oh, two resource, three, three, great, shielded. Okay, bounty. Eh, it probably doesn't matter. It does. And there are a lot of situations where if I had played Dr. Evazan instead of like a crafty smuggler, I lost the game because of Dr. Evazan. They would do things like turn five, six resources, kill your Evazan, ready six resources, make an absurd play, save the game, have a board presence, and I just can't come back from that. Dr. Evazan is good where he's good, and he's really bad when he's bad. Against aggro decks, generally Dr. Evazan's a little bit better because your opponents don't really want to be killing your units, and therefore you have an oversetted unit that just gives you a lot of value. That's good. Against mid-range control decks, Dr. Evazan, pretty mediocre. I think because of that swinging nature, I can't really put him higher than like the end of B tier, arguably. Uh, no, 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 no. I, I think the higher end of B tier is, is where I would want to keep him. Because again, he is good where he's good, but bad where he's bad. And uh, you do have to be careful with Dr. Evazan. There are some times where you have like a fugitive Wookiee and a Dr. Evazan in hand, and you're like, resource Dr. Evazan. I do not want him in this matchup. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Dryden Voss. Oh man, Dryden Voss. This is a card that is like one of the cards I've been trying to play with the most recently. This guy, when you play, you get to choose a capture card guarded by a unit you control. You get to play it for free. Sweet, right? Eh, not really. Um, unless you're playing Jabba. Every other capture card in the game besides legal authority is pretty weak. But here's the problem with Dryden Voss is unlike legal authority or like, okay, unlike the capture cards, um, who just need to have a unit that they control and a unit that enemy controls. Dryden Voss now has to have, well, you had to have a unit you control that has captured an enemy unit and to have lived till seven resources so that you can play Dryden Voss, you can play it for free. That's like super unrealistic. If you're playing Jabba on the other hand, Jabba flips, captures a unit, Dryden Voss comes down and you can do all of that in one turn. Yes, you need to have a secondary unit, but that's usually pretty common. So Dryden Voss is really, in my opinion, only playable in Jabba. That's the only time when Dryden Voss is playable. And for that reason, I think, again, similar to like um, some of the other cards we talked about, like Migs Mayfeld and, and uh, stuff like that, I uh, can't put him higher than like the bottom of B tier. He is a powerful legendary and he does something crazy. It's just that there is so many situations where it's not going to work unless you're playing with something like a Jabba. Um, and that's what I found. Xanadu Blood, one of the new space units that's kind of in the same slot as a Fett's Fire Spray. I've actually been a lot more impressed with this card than I expected to be. Um, the ability to return other Underworld cards to go ahead and exhaust a unit or a resource is actually really impactful and can help you win a lot of race scenarios. Uh, and uh, it's actually just a really strong card. It's an underworld card, which triggers Cat Bane. It works with Mach Loonkey, which is pretty impactful as well. Um, bouncing another underworld unit can be really good, especially if it's like a Dr. Evazel that's lost its shield or a Bazine Natal late in the game, where maybe you can pick her out with her hand or uh, I don't know, something that's that's good or maybe even like, you know, picking up, up a mall or something. Um, you can do all that type of stuff. Actually, a solid card at the bottom of AIDS here. Nothing like crazy. Just a solid card that actually has some pretty good uses and exhausting units can help you win the race sometimes and has actually caused me some major issues, especially against like Cad Bane sometimes. Triple Dark Raid. This is a card I've been very impressed with. This is a card that uh, just comes in, deals a bunch of damage. It, as I said in any of my videos that I've played tri Triple Dark Raid, you have to think of Triple Dark Raid as like a for a cause. It's a burn spell. It's not something that's going to give you a lot of value, right? You play it, you get a space unit, you come in, you swing for a bunch of damage, and then it bounces to your hand. 
But remember, you get to swing with things like Xanadu Blood, Bet's Fire Spray, Ruthless Raiders, that type of scenario. And for that reason, he gonna end up in A tier. I think Triple Dark Raid, well, maybe not quite as good as Evidence of the Crime. This thing is just so swingy. Um, but Triple Dark Raid actually ends up being pretty powerful in a card that can really swing a game if you are playing the certain archetypes that are really good with it. Um, I think that you can play it in Boba Yellow, but uh, that one maybe doesn't even necessarily need Triple Dark Raid. Again, any deck that has like a couple of six slash cheap space units to play off Triple Dark Raid is good. Like if you play a Triple Dark Raid and you hit something like, well, uh, a Lurking TIE Phantom and you hit for four, that was literally a four cause, right? As soon as your opponent doesn't have a Sentinel, that's what it's kind of like. So that's what you have to think about. And yes, it does do its job if that's what you're trying to do. Zori Bliss, five resources for a 4-7 that uh, makes you disc draw cards and discard cards, essentially looting through your deck. Five resource, 4-7. Mm, pretty mediocre stat line. At least it's better than like an Effent Mom. The ability, not that great, especially since it's only an on attack trigger. The smuggle cost higher, which means it's even weaker. This card, uh, I do not like. I do not like. Um, I think that Effent Mon is actually just better than her. Uh, despite that, I think that the stat line is okay, but I think that putting her at the bottom of B tier is exactly where I would want to keep her. You can even drop her down into the C tier even further. And in fact, you know what? I actually don't like her more than, um, than Sugi or Enterprising Lackeys, even though those are double aspect. So I'm actually going to put her at like the top end of C tier. Next up, we have Unrefusable Offer. This is one of the hardest cards to evaluate, in my opinion. Um, the ability to play a, a unit for free and enter play ready, you could potentially, you know, defeat the units, get you some value afterwards. This really needs to have some specific units to get you some cool, cool things going on, right? Unrefusable offer, you know, getting something like a Ruthless Raider, for example, is really sweet. Um, remember your opponent defeats the units and then you claim the bounty. So, um, you don't actually go ahead and, and potentially get some things going. Uh, it can have some really high impact against certain cards and then really weak impact against others. And that's kind of a lot of these cunning cards, unfortunately. To me, this is like a win more card usually, because if you're claiming this bounty, um, you probably get to get in some more damage and then maybe you get to you know close out the game a little bit quicker. But chances are, if you play this on opponent's units, then they can probably control when it's actually good for them for it to die. And that's a little bit unfortunate for me. I actually don't think this card's very good. Maybe like C tier. That's kind of where I'd keep it right now. I could be wrong about this card though. Um, this is one of those cards that really swings based on what deck you're playing and what your deck your opponent is playing. Let the Wookiee win. Oh my gosh. I wish this card was sweet. I wish we had more Wookiees. This is an absolute D. Probably the worst card in the whole, worst rare or legendary in the whole set. Um, even worse than like Mystic Reflection. The problem with this card is that your opponent chooses one. And uh, the first one is readying up six resources. So if you're playing this on turn two, let's say, to try to get some damage in with a Wookiee, you're probably going to just have your opponent ready up resources and you're not even going to get that much value out of it. You've essentially played, you paid two resources to ready up a one plus one resource and you, well, you don't even necessarily do that because you paid two resources. You have three resources. You probably ready up two resources. You just essentially wasted a card. If you're able to attack with a Wookiee, it is good, but there's not enough Wookiees for that to work right now. I think there's literally like nine Wookiees in the entire set, two and one. And not all of them are in the same colors. So um, I think it's like mostly blue, yellow, but most of them are very expensive, like Chewbacca, Tarful, Gentle Giant. So that's not really that relevant. It's just not a good card. And unfortunately just has too much modality to it that if you're trying to play a Wookiee deck, you're already in a bad spot and then let the Wookiee win. Not also a very good card to draw unless you have all Wookiees and you have resources that you've already spent. DJ, okay. This is probably the most controversial card I've seen out of the rares and legendaries. A lot of people love it and a lot of people hate it. Um, I'm at more of the hater camp. I think this card's pretty mediocre. Um, the three resource three five is okay. It's not amazing. It's something that I usually resource, especially if like if you play with Cassian, it's not a good card unless you're trying to smuggle them out. 
And remember, DJ Smuggle is very powerful. You essentially get to choose a resource that your opponent controls and you steal it, right? That's awesome. But it's seven to smuggle and it's double cunning to smuggle. If you think about what double cunning is trying to do, it's not trying to ramp and, you know, get this situation going where you're stealing your opponent's resources and getting value from it. The only chance I think DJ really has is when you're playing Lando and you're paying five for this and all you've done is essentially played a three five for five and you've just defeated one of your opponent's resources. That's kind of what it does, which can do some work. It's just not that powerful. Um, for me, it's ooh, gonna end up, uh, I'll give it a little bit of credit and at the bottom of B tier. This is really very, uh, very specific card. And again, double cunning does not want to be getting to seven resources almost ever. When have you seen a double cunning deck get to seven resources? And if you're paying it for nine resources, oh, you're totally doomed. Like you can play Crate Dragon for nine resources. You don't want to be playing DJ for nine resources. Heck no. Uh, anyways, we've got two more uh, cunning cards left. We have Tobias Beckett, four resource, four five. Anytime you play a non-unit card, you can exhaust stuff that costs the same or less than the card that's played. If this said uh, the same or less than power on Tobias Beckett, like four or less would be sweet. But oftentimes your upgrades that you're playing are two or three costed. And that is the weak part about Tobias Beckett. If this had a similar ability to Mandalorian, I'd be a much higher in Tobias Beckett, but I am not. Because I've played with Mandalorian a lot, the ability to exhaust units when you play things is really powerful. But Mandalorian gives you the ability to hit any four HP or less units, which is a lot more units than hitting things that cost essentially three or less resources. That is a big difference. And to me, this is a card that uh, can do some things, um, and it's not terrible. I would probably put it next to like Costca Reeves as it kind of does a similar thing where if it does its thing, it does something pretty nice and it has a decent stat line, but it doesn't do it often. And it's not consistent enough for me to really see some value out of putting a lot of Tobias Beckett's in my deck. And lastly, we have Evacuate. This is a car that a lot of people were excited about, including myself. And I'm happy to say that it actually did do some major, major work um, in like some of the more controlling cunning decks, which, uh, I said earlier that cunning doesn't really want to be going to seven resources or double cunning, but you know, you can play cunning blue. And in that case, then you can go to six resources, seven resources and actually get some value. This is actually an A tier card. This is a card that actually makes cunning, uh, vigilance, something of a viable archetype because you can do the mix of evacuating on six resources and then super laser blasting two turns later while your opponent's trying to rebuild. And that can be a powerful kind of one, two and evacuate helps you kind of stall out um, until that point. So strong card, very, very specific scenarios, but it does do really, really well in those specific scenarios. Uh, and uh, I think worthy of an A tier slot just because of that. That's going to wrap up all the actual kind of color aspects, but we do have villainy and heroism to kind of finish it off. So let's finish it off with those. Let's start off with our heroism cards. We've got two of them. We have tech and tech three resource two, five, pretty bad stat line, right? We have three resource three fives running around very frequently, and those aren't usually good enough. And uh, giving all of your friendly resources smuggle and that being two extra costs to play any of those cards is just way too expensive. It just does not actually do anything uh for you realistically we've seen smuggle and we've seen the fact that if you're paying two resources extra for your cards that you've already you know kind of resourced you're not actually wanting to play those cards tech to me is like a, a hope and a dream he's a c tier card he can do some things and he's really cool and limited but outside of that just not a card i'm really going to be playing ever tarful three or three nine for seven resource with a restore to and uh, has some Wookiee synergies, okay? This is where the Wookiee deck comes in. Okay, I've tried Tarful. I've tried the Wookiees. I've tried to build a Wookiee deck. It's not good. I've had someone in person play a Wookiee deck. It's not good. Um, this card is one of the better Wookiees, and it does some cool things, especially since you can, like, attack something for the, for three damage, and then because your Wookiee's dealing dealt damage, then you get to deal some more damage to an opponent, which is kind of cool, or more opponent to the unit, uh, more damage to a unit, which is kind of cool, but... Doesn't do enough. Too many not good Wookiees. Absolute C tier. Probably closer to the bottom of C tier, unfortunately. 
Next up, we have Altering the Deal as our first villainy card. So Altering the Deal allows you to essentially permanently remove one of those capture cards that you have uh, and put it into the discard pile. Here's what you have to think about this card. This is not a one resource removal card. It is essentially like a three resource or four resource removal card because you have to have a unit, you have to have that unit capture something, and then you can permanently remove it with altering the deal. So it costed you two cards, a good setup, and the same amount of resources that you could have used for like an open fire or like a takedown or something like that. This card, I think, maybe have potential in the future. Uh, so I'm not going to put it in the D tier because I do think this is one of the more unique mechanics that we have. But right now, I've not seen this card really come into play as a card that I want to play. And uh, it doesn't have actually some really exciting things to it yet. And lastly, we have Kragen Gore. A pretty sweet one. He is a 6 resource 6-6. Six, six, and uh, he gives... Anytime an enemy unit attacks your base, you get to give a shield token to a friendly unit in the same arena. So if this guy's on the battlefield and you want to go past him, you suddenly have to deal with some massively shield up enemy units. Unfortunately, that doesn't usually happen. If you play this guy, your opponent usually just wants to kill him. And if they can bypass him and attack your base, you've probably just lost. Right, he's not going to change that for you, and I think that's the biggest problem with Kragen Gore. He deters your opponent from attacking your base, but if he's kind of sitting there and your opponent can kill him, then they will. And he's not that big of a deterrent; he doesn't do enough. And if your opponent doesn't care, then that doesn't do anything from actually helping you survive in the game. So for me, he's not terrible. Six resource, six six, not terrible. Um, kind of an okay stat line on the weaker side of things. His ability is interesting and it can do some work. There's also the biggest thing, which is if your opponent just lane dodge and you have all space units and you play a Kragen Gore and you're like, oh, this card does actually nothing, then you're really sad. To me, this is like a, a pretty like standard B tier card. And actually, I would probably put him at the very end of B tier as a card that I've been pretty unimpressed with so far. But that is every rare and legendary ranked. I'm going to go ahead and uh, just walk through some of my final thoughts on this list and... Uh, well, wrap up the video here. So the biggest thing for me as I was going through all these cards and playing with all the cards is red has gotten a lot more powerful. Um, it's again, a little bit misleading because Hotshot Blaster is really a yellow card. So we have three red cards, one yellow card and one green card in the S tier category. I think this is also indicative of kind of maybe where the meta is at and potentially could change going forward and also why we don't see any control decks. I've tried playing control decks, and usually if you're playing a control deck, you, you have to kind of delve into Vigilance um, as an aspect because that's kind of one of the only controlling, true controlling colors. But uh, it makes sense that we don't really have enough controlling cards to actually compete against the new tools that uh, Heroism has, or more specifically, Red has. Crate Dragon, Podamron, Wreckers, potentially all three in the same deck. Maul has been an absolute powerhouse for sure, and Hotshot Blaster is giving aggro dual, uh, decks a new tool. Heck, if you play Sablon Sabine, which was a very popular deck set one, you get Hotshot Blaster, you get Poe Dameron, and you get Wrecker. That's crazy. You even get Heroic Resolve potentially if you want to play that. So pretty crazy that uh, Red is just getting so many powerful cards. I think one of the sleepers potentially of, um, of, the, of the new set is uh, something like Kira. I think a lot of people are doubting Kira. I think that she's actually a pretty nice tempo play. Um, I think that, you know, you might be surprised to see her on the A tier side of things. Same with Legal Authority. Uh, I think this card is actually a lot better than, you know, some people think. I think it ends up being only good in certain decks. Um, and it's really powerful in those decks, but, you know, it can actually have a home in a, a decent amount of decks. And also, I think a lot of people are really focused in on certain effects that used to be good or comparing to set one, um, where oftentimes set two is a lot different. Things like Dr. Evazon being a 3-3 three, three shielded. Well, that could have been potentially better in set one, but set two has a lot more options. Bazin Natal, for example, there's not as many situations where you have to get rid of the, your opponent's super laser blast, for example. Um, so Bazin Natal isn't as relevant, for example. Um, but overall, that's kind of the list, guys. I'm sure people disagree with a lot of placements on this list. I think overall, it's pretty reasonable to kind of have the cards where I'm placing them. I think that it's not like a crazy person scenario, but maybe I'm wrong about certain cards. 
I have played a lot of the game, but I'm not perfect and I haven't tested every single possible combination, but uh, I have played a lot and I have seen basically every single one of these cards played against me or played with it. So thanks for watching everyone. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comment section down below and I will see you all for the next video.